a Hostos uh, College, and a lot of people will call him Dr. Uh, Wilson and so on and so forth. The highest accolade you can give to somebody is call him Brother Wilson, because we don't have really many schools uh, that really bestow these degrees and things on people. And there are people who exist in the community who can literally tell those people who have earned those degrees in some of those places where they bestow degrees, they could tell them to take their degree and make it into toilet paper. There are people who don't have degrees themselves who could tell other people who are in their same field to take their degree and make it into toilet paper. For instance, Professor John Henry Clark doesn't even have a, um, didn't even graduate from high school. The world's foremost African historian did not graduate from high school. He earned a GED, he did a little college, little college, but basically he was self-taught and learned under Schomburg and learned um, through his own private research. But if we can't call him doctor, we're crazy. Eventually he was given an honorary doctorate, I think, by the University of Denver. But a lot of our greatest minds don't have these white man's credentials because they are people who are in charge of granting the credentials. Brother Amos Wilson may be a doctor now, but he's been a doctor for a long time. He's been a doctor for a long time because of the depth of the research that he does and because of the kind of Afrocentric insight that he brings to it. His first book to come to my attention was The Developmental Psychology of the Black Child, and it stands out there alone. Any black person who wants to know something about the development of our children, you have to go to that book. He had another book in between there uh, that I believe was on various types of therapies, and the current book uh, that is very popular is a book called uh, Black on Black Violence, and it has a subtitle which uh, makes reference to the fact that even black on black violence is in some way serving uh, white domination. The brother is a wonderful lecturer, always learn something every time I sit and listen to him. Uh, he is the highest meaning of doctor, and uh, he could tell me to take my little piece of thing and, and make toilet paper out of it. I hope we'll give him a warm greeting and that we will tune our ears and our consciousness to receive some of the information that he has for us. Brothers and sisters, let's give a spirited welcome to brother Dr. Amos Wilson. putting some of you through some sort of uh, vocabulary hoops there. But uh, hang in with it. Uh, it is a book I think you have to sort of perhaps read a couple of times. Uh, I think the thing that throws most people is uh, the hyphenations. If you kind of look at it a little closely, you'll see that it's just old words sort of sewn together with hyphens in, off, in order to sort of uh, deal with some concepts I think that are not dealt with in everyday life and dealt with in terms of where we are as a people. The outline of the book is, uh, I think, uh, very simple. Obviously, the first section deals with the presentation of the statistics, the so-called crime statistics, followed by the idea that these statistics have to be very carefully scrutinized uh, that they create halos that do not necessarily represent reality. 
And that's, that's really what that is about, to sort of warn you as to how they are used to create uh, points of view and misperceptions relative to our people. The essence of that text is to indicate that so-called black-on-black criminality, black-on-black violence, is a social act, that crime is a social act. It is a social interaction. It's not one that people desire necessarily, but it is a form of social interaction. And it occurs within a social context. Crime occurs within a society. And it is motivated by social values and ideas. So if people mug, they, they mug to often get money to buy things that the media and other propaganda organizations have told them are valuable. Things that uh, they've been made to think will um, enhance their self-image, uh, their social status. So what I'm trying to get across there is that a good deal of so-called criminality and violence is generated by the society itself, by the nature of its marketing system. And therefore, you cannot detach criminality and criminal acts and even black on black violence from the nature of the social system in which it occurs. And this, this is the essence of what we're talking about here. This is followed by the idea then that black on black violence being motivated, instigated to a great extent by the social system in which it occurs, then functions to maintain that system, you see, to keep that system uh, sustained. You see, and this is the way we have to, and I'm trying to get a different vision here, to move you from the standard European idea that crime is purely an individual act and it purely flows out of the evil within the individual's mind. This is a tendency of European sociologists and criminologists who are in the end apologists for the social system. And by making it appear that crime flows out of an individual criminal nature, from an individual criminal personality, you do not look at the social system as a cause of crime, as an instigator of crime. You do not see criminality in segments of that social system as necessary to maintaining that system. And therefore, you get engaged in self-blame and in blaming the victim, and you cooperate with the system against your own survival. And this is what we're talking about here. And, and this is what, in essence, this book is about. It means then that the transformation of criminality in the African American community must involve a transformation of the African American community, not a mere rehabilitation of individual criminals. You see, you got this whole concept of so-called rehabilitation. And the idea is that you sit down in some group sessions or some one-on-one -on -one sessions and you somehow rehabilitate uh, criminals and you somehow reduce the crime rate. Another Eurocentric myth. I try to tell my class all the time, the one that I'm doing on uh, children at risk, about their going into courses in special ed where they get recipes and descriptions of learning disabled children. And they're made to think that once they learn all of the characteristics and the techniques, that they are going to have an, a significant impact in transforming those children. Not on your life, 
These children are being created by this system by the thousands. And you're not going to get enough social workers and therapists and school psychologists and counselors doing one-on-one -on -one therapy and small group therapy stuff to transform this situation. Even though we use them and we can need them, but this is not going to transform the situation. Because learning disabledness is a political necessity in this society and the inability, so-called, of many of our children to learn is, is necessary to maintain this social system and it is generated by this social system. And yet the system wants to make you think that you can sweep back the ocean with the broom. No. Communal transformations have to take place, both within the African American community and ultimately in the so-called broader American community if we are to transform the problems that are occurring in our classes and in our streets. So perhaps sometimes people are having some problem with trying to move from the standard frames of reference which deal with individualism and approach problems from individualistic points of view to an effort to look at them on a different level. Hang in with the text. In that context, I'm going to do a little self-advertising here. It might um, be helpful to read an upcoming publication coming out uh, back toward the back end of January called An Outline for Understanding, Remediating, and Preventing Black Adolescent Violence. So you can look for that about the end of uh, February. It's an outline, essentially, of about 100, maybe 120 pages. And perhaps this will, will be helpful in uh, interpreting the black on black violence. Here we're going to look at then how so-called black on black violence is created by white on black violence. The violence that begets violence. And how whites have engaged in unre unrelentless violence against black people right up to this very second. It has never stopped. From the very first moment we came into contact with these people, the violence on all levels, not only the violence of slavery, the violence of peonage during Reconstruction and so forth, the violence of Jim Crowism, the violence of lynching, but also the violence of economic deprivation, the violence of the assassination of black culture and of the black character, violence in terms of injustice, uh, violence in terms of miseducation, on and on and on it goes and it has gone. And this violence has caused violent reactions in our people. You mix that then with the nature of adolescence in America, where adolescence itself represents a struggle for identity, a struggle to, to define one's future course in life, a struggle to determine one's occupational and vocational career, a struggle to determine one's gender identity, race identity, uh, and the other struggles of adolescence. You combine that with the unrelenting assault on the black community, with the psychological after effects and the psychological effects that are pervasive throughout the black community as a result of this, these assaults. And then you combine that further with the ecological or physical political environment that our youth had to live in. The so-called ghettos, the high levels of unemployment, the miseducation, the overflow of drugs, the overflow of weapons, the 
tremendous attack of the mass media on the desiring structure of our youth using their own music and their own culture to inculcate into them all kinds of desires and tastes which the society is not prepared to uh, uh, put them in a position to satisfy and therefore literally tantalizing them into criminal activity. The change in the very nature of the black family, you must recognize the so-called single-headed black family is essentially a phenomenon that has occurred since the 1970s. This is, was not typical of black adolescents before that time. You must realize the fantastic change that has occurred in the social and political nature of black life in the last 20 years. It has been profound. That is one of the reasons why you cannot compare if you are an adult my age and maybe a bit younger, you cannot compare your adolescence on a whole with the adolescence of, of the current black youth today. Not by a long shot. Up to uh, the end of the 60s and in the early 70s, the, vet, the, the large majority of black families were still headed by, by uh, two, two members. There were, there were many other things going on. Now you have a situation where the, where the largest percentage are single-headed families in the midst of all of these other things that we're talking about. And how all of these things then coalesce to create the kind of situation we're confronted with today. So if you, you can perhaps move back from this book back to black, on vi um, black violence, and you can get a deeper sense of how then the so-called criminality and the violence of blacks against blacks is created by a social situation and a social structure. And I'm going to talk a bit later about this. Remember, and I'll, I'll make a reference already to it, but I'll make a reference again. Where is the society? When we talk about society, where is it? Is it out there? No, society is not out there. Society is where? It is where? In us. A society can only be carried within the minds and bodies of its members. It does not exist as an entity outside of the minds and bodies of people. So when we talk about a society and a social structure, it must represent itself in the behavior of people and of individuals. But of course, Eurocentric psychology likes to make you think that society exists outside and separate from people. That is logically impossible. And it's, it's, it's the stupidity that's uh, perpetrated on the populations upon our people and often leads to serious misunderstandings, both of ourselves and of our situations. So anyway, Look for an outline for understanding and remediating and preventing black adolescent violence. And while you're at it, you can also look for uh, the other publication referred to as the falsification and mislabeling of African consciousness and behavior. Here we're going to talk about how European psychology colludes with European historiography to falsify the consciousness and minds of African people, and after falsifying them, to mislabel them and misdiagnose African people, and therefore mistreat them in the name of rehabilitation, which is one of the reasons why, of course, the so-called rehabilitative establishment never really rehabilitates so-called black-on-black criminals. They cannot afford to. The paradigm that they use is ultimately designed to maintain criminality. A third publication, which will also be coming out in January, will be one that's related more closely to the developmental psychology of the black child. It is titled, Awakening the Natural Genius of African American Children. And uh, of course, those of you who read black on uh, uh, the developmental psychology of the black child recall 
that uh, the black child was born and is born with a natural head start. It is second in intellectual potential to no other children on this earth. This book then, Awakening the Natural Genius of, the African, -Ameri of African American Children, then it, it specifically deals with the rearing approaches and educational approaches which can be used to awaken that genius that we know is there and keep it alive and develop it so that we can achieve our liberation as a people. We have a third, uh, we have a fourth publication which is not my own, but one that I recommend. All of these will be coming out toward the end of uh, January, so <laughs> you were right, we've been quite busy. Uh, this is by Dr. Louise Spencer Strahan, called Confronting the Color Crisis in the African Diaspora, Emphasis Jamaica, looking at the co issues of color within an Af African uh, nation and society and how and the ramifications uh, that these differences in skin color uh, have for African political, economic, and social development. So we'd appreciate your patronage and your attention. Of course, we hope that uh, you will find these books educational. We expect by the end of February to have another publication referred, uh, that's tentatively titled Educating the African American Child for the 21st Century, a rationale for an African-centered education. And here we will have about, about four or 500 pages for you so that we can go in great detail about the education of our children and we will review various educational programs uh, we will look at the learning styles of uh, African-American children and those kinds of things so that uh, those who hopefully re review this book can walk away with it or walk away from it or, or use the book as a handbook to develop practical, real programs for educating our children uh, as a way of attaining our uh, liberation as a people. One more reminder here, we, I do, normally do not sell my own book. I generally let the uh, books be sold by local vendors. Um, what I'm doing here today is also letting these books be sold by uh, Cimitap, so that 40% of the retail price goes to the Cimitap organization as a part of contributing to what you're doing here and supporting what you're doing here. <clears throat> okay, I want to talk a bit here then today about the identity crisis within the African American community, myth or reality. And this uh, topic was provoked by a spate of articles that uh, occurred within the newspapers, that were published in the newspapers within the last couple of weeks. And I found it very interesting, you know, that you just sort of had a, uh, a simultaneous occurrence of certain events and uh, certain writings in the newspaper. And obviously, as members of Cimitap, you know, you, you, I'm, certainly, uh, I'm certainly have been educated around the idea that you read newspapers not only in terms of their content, but you read them in terms of their format, in terms of the timing of stories. Why do certain stories occur at certain times? And regardless as to whether the stories contain truth or falsehood, just meditating about the time they are being published can tell you a great deal, whether they are true or false. Where they occur in the paper itself, where the articles are placed, can be very informative uh, as well. How does news, how is news used by the establishment? What is the role of newspapers in the establishment? 
Do papers report the news or do they make the news? You have to come to a newspaper and to news media with these kinds of questions in mind. Was the Leonard Jeffries controversy a situation of reporting news or was it a situation of making news by newspapers? Was it a situation of reporting a speech or the use of a speech to create a type of consciousness and to achieve specific political and cultural goals? And what goals were being sought by these papers as they uh, wrote about Jeffries and, and that controversy? It's very important to, to ask those questions because some people misleadingly thought that the Jeffries controversy was about truth and falsehood, or truth and lies, and it had nothing to do with truth. That's why you never saw them debating Jeffries' documentations, never answering uh, whether what he was saying was true or not, because that wasn't the point. And we must recognize then that often the publishing of news and so forth is not about then the publishing of truth or necessarily the publishing of lies, but about the manipulation of consciousness and about the achievement of particular social and political goals. And often they are not even about the person who is at the center of the story. The person is often secondary to the whole purpose of what's going on and is merely a cog or a pawn being used. If you don't know that, though, you will personalize the issues and miss the whole point of what is going on. And we, as people, must remove ourselves from this tendency to personalize stories and issues. I'll give a quick example of that. I'm sure there are many blacks now in Louisiana who are going to sleep after having come out to the polls and voted Duke down. And who are feeling very proud about their voting prowess. And who saw the danger as Duke. <laughs> who forgot their history, by the way. And remember that at another time in history, they were able to vote too. And those votes were taken away from them. And it took almost 100 years for them to regain the right to vote. So that, in a sense, this voting against Duke does not necessarily represent black power. It was the absence of black power during the Reconstruction that permitted the voting, the, uh, the franchise that blacks had for voting to be taken away. What then makes us sure that this franchise won't be taken away again? What have we done as a people to ensure that our right to vote will be determined by our power, not by the power of others? And I think we've done relatively little in that regard. There are some who are forgetting that 55% of whites voted for David. <laughs> Did those 55% of the majority of whites who voted just walk away and forget about what they were concerned with simply because Duke didn't win office, or are they still there? In other words, then, the issue moves beyond David Duke to the fact that we have a large number of whites who have certain attitudes, and those whites are still alive and well, and those attitudes are still there, whether David Duke lives or dies tomorrow. So the issue is not Duke. The issue is a group of white folk and a sizable group of white folk who have specific types of attitudes who are still there and who still then pose a threat to black freedom. In fact, Duke alone poses no threat to black folk. He's one person. You get the same kind of game that goes on with Hitler, 
We get the white media that projects the mad Hitler. Hitler who through his great oratory uh, hypnotizes the German people. That's nonsense. Hitler did not build the concentration camps alone. Hitler did not go into Poland by himself. It took a whole German nation to cooperate with Hitler. If the German nation did not accept Hitler and support Hitler, then Hitler could not have had any influence or effect on history whatsoever. But we have a media, you see, that makes you perceive Hitler is a bad guy. It was the German people in relationship to Hitler that created the problem. And in the end, then it won't be individuals only, it will be groups of people against other groups of people. But if you have this tendency then to get caught up in individuals, you're gonna miss the group phenomena. And you will miss often the organization of whole armies and whole groups of people against you. And you will be made to think simply because you vote down one individual, you have solved your problem. You could be no more wrong. You, can, you cannot be more wrong. What am I saying here then? We not only must read newspapers, but we must continue to educate ourselves in how to read them. So in that context, I find it interesting that we get this whole spate of stories here in the last couple of weeks on identity. Some of you might have seen, what is it called, USA Today. And we have it here, I'm trying to get the date here, December 2nd, 1991. Cover story, it's titled, Dealing with the Discords of Diversity. And another one here called, Producing a Paler Shade of Skin Color. And we got a picture here of Michael Jackson. Jackson, his hit song, Rejects Color Labels. That's interesting. A song is going to reject color labels. That's another thing I think we make a mistake of. We think we can just sing our troubles away, right? Sing a good song and the labels disappear. <laughs> and it starts out, who's black, who's white, who's right? Increasing high, increasingly high profile African American Filmmakers, a Supreme Court nominee, even a mega famous singer are engaging in public emotional examinations of black identity in the 90s. Is that right? Are these people really engaging in public emotional examinations of black identity? And he jumps over and says, uh, quotes Michael, I'm not going to spend my life being a color. Ignorant. Very ignorant. As an emerging black middle class slips into the mainstream, it faces questions about the duty to stay black. <laughs> I mean, black is something you just take on and take off. Is that, is that what we have here? <laughs> you know, uplift poor blacks and promote black culture. Is that what is going on in the black middle class? The black middle class now is deciding whether it will stay black? You mean it has a choice of being other than black? <laughs> and is it now questioning whether it will continue to uplift poor blacks and promote black culture? These concerns are reflected in the work and action of black filmmakers, writers, artists, and others. Who's blacker? Clarence Thomas, a Thurgood Marshall. Spike Lee, a port activist, Amiri Baraka. They've all been cross-examined in the media in racial terms. Whose media? New York Times, November 30th, 1991. In a, in a 90s quest for black identity, intense doubts and disagreement. Lena Williams of the New York Times. I hope one day similar to happen, and maybe you're doing this already, can perhaps uh, call together these black journalists and so forth and uh, 
educate them uh, a bit as well. So we get here, the ever-changing black experience in America is being assessed with a new intensity. Skin color, how you talk, more specifically what you say, how you live your life are examples of the test being used to determine what it means to be black in the 1990s. Not since the tumultuous 1960s has there been such an intense focus on blackness. And it jumps over to talks about books and news articles. The topic range from what's black, who's black, what's not, to black like who. Films like School Days, Living Large, Strictly Business have used satire to explore racial conflict and contradiction among blacks. And they quote a uh, psychologist from DePaul University, aside from skin color, there's something to be, there's something to being ethnically black in terms of outlook on life, values, and beliefs. It goes on to say, some blacks say that black Americans cannot afford to waste time on such issues when so many blacks face a multitude of problems like drug abuse, unemployment, prejudice, and the disproportion of blacks among crime victims. And it's an amazing statement here. We would argue that to a great, great good extent, a lot of the issues just mentioned flow from the attempt to separate us from our identity. And in many instances, reflect issues around people who are trying to escape their identity. I made the argument in black on black violence that the black on black criminal to a great extent is a white racist in black skin. A person who has internalized white racist attitudes and has identified with his victimizers and expresses his victimization by victimizing other black people. That his behavior reflects the absence of an appropriate black and African identity and that much of the unemployment and much of the other issues flow from an absence or an incomplete African identity. We get quotations from various experts here, including Mr. Julius Lester, a professor of Judaic studies, speaking of identity here at the University of Massachusetts, says that being black has evolved into a form of social fascism in the past two decades, especially on campus. So uh, whites have stopped being fascist and stopped ruling. So the issue now is not white fascism or white racism, but black fascism. A related article, of course, that came out again on December uh, 2nd, 1991, Black White Marriages Rise but social acceptance lags. Then on the same page, two who lost their way in urban wilds. A culture of violence takes a deadly toll in East New York. Talking about the young man that was killed uh, in the school over there. Then we came right back around here on November 25th. Gold earrings, this is the New York Times again. Gold earrings and protection. More girls take road to violence. And now they're talking about young ladies who seem to be engaged more and more in violence in order to uh, buy gold earrings and other things. And looking at our own papers here, uh, you, you saw two pieces of this weekend in the city, Sun Clinton, Clinton Cox, Am I Black Enough for You? So, of course, in the, in the Cox Manor writes a very pertinent and very learned uh, piece here. And another in the New York Amsterdam News, Two Kinds of Blackness by Manning Marable. Cox, I think, makes some very pertinent statements here, as well as Marable, of course. It seems, according to the article, 
uh, he again is referring to the New York Times pieces, that black people are no longer sure who's black. I had failed somehow to notice this phenomenon among my acquaintances. And he makes some other statements here then about the fact that, uh, well, I don't know how the discussion is going to turn out, especially if it's carried out, carried on mainly in the white media. But then the majority population in this country always has tried to define who was and who wasn't black. And I think this is a part of the key to these articles, that we have to keep in mind that the white population and the white man has always sought to define race and to define identity and to define it, to define it in terms that would maintain his own uh, superiority in the world and define it, define racial identity and put people in racial categories in ways to maintain his own status in the world or to advance his own interest. So you can begin to get some idea that this spate of articles must imply on some level that whites need to readjust racial identity and racial definition. And we must ask the question why, to what end, are they seeking to readjust this identity? We, we, we have gotten ourselves caught up in a situation which is very peculiar sometimes when it comes to racial identity, where when you look at the old white racist writers, and even many of us somewhat unconsciously get involved in this, the great part of the emphasis was on why are black people black? You know, and how did we come to have our color? And how did we come to have our texture of hair and so forth? And why are, uh, are there colored people in the world? And you know, if you don't watch it, you get caught up with that. When the anomaly in the world is what? White skin. And, and with the vast majority of the world being what? None white. <laughs> the, the, the issue becomes, how did these people appear in the world? How can we explain their presence in the world? But in typical white fashion, the issue is always what? Reversed. And so people get caught up in discussing the most common issue and not looking at the most uncommon one, the one that really needs explanation. How does 10%, how did this 10% of non-color come into the world, and how did it achieve a position in the world such that it has deigned to give itself authority to categorize the race and identity of other people? And why has this, these other large majorities in the world permitted this minority to do so? It sort of reminds me again of, of just what's going on in the real world anyway. I looked the other day and it indicated that the so-called Jewish population is 1.8% of the American population. You wouldn't think that in terms of the tremendous influence that population has in this country. And yet, when you look at it too, in terms of its world population, you must again question, how is it that this speck of a group in the world population attains so much attention and has such a high profile in the world? But again, we are reversed in the way we perceive the world. We go to Channel 13 to look for objective news, <laughs> humanistic news. And we get these great discussions about nuclear proliferation in the third world as representing the great danger. And we get, again, the bad guy syndrome the uh, Hussein danger. You got the UN over there trying to take out all of his, his nuclear weapons. And again, you get this personalized history, right? Saddam Hussein, you know, has all of these nuclear weapons and was on the verge of getting these nuclear weapons and endangering the world. So Hussein by himself. We, 
when anyone would tell you that these weapons were created and brought into being by the super moralistic, humanistic Europeans who supplied him with those weapons. But yet we get this great discussion and there's not one mention of Israel and the danger that Israel represents to world peace. And the danger, the tremendous danger that a theocratic state, which is what Israel is, a state that argues that God gave them this land from the Euphrates and, and to this end, and Jordan is a really a part of Israel, and, and uh, all the way up to Damascus, that is a part of Israel, and this is a part of Israel because God said so in the Bible. You now have the most lethal mixture of genocide going when you attach great military power to religious fanaticism. And yet, you get the great Channel 13 being so concerned about the third world containing weapons. Where is the discussion about this weaponry in South Africa? Where is the discussion about the fact that the United States has been the only country that has actually used these weapons and dropped them on other people? Why aren't we talking about disarming this country? You see? But typically, as I've said many times and again, ladies and gentlemen, in order for a minority to rule this world, they have to reverse reality. They have to turn it completely around. And those who are ruled must become backwards in their perception and in their thinking and in their behavior. They, too, must inculcate and internalize backwardness. And they must express their freedom as a freedom only to do the wrong thing. So he talks about it here, and you can read further uh, pieces here. Marable's piece, I think, is, is a very interesting piece, Two Kinds of Blackness in the Amsterdam, New York Amsterdam News, particularly when he talks about two ways of looking at race. One he mentions here, race is essentially a group identity imposed on individuals. And of course he talked about the situation that race is not purely self-chosen by a people or by an individual. It is imposed by people outside of oneself. I think I heard Karanga the other day use what I thought was a trenchant piece, a uh, trenchant statement that he said, uh, I believe is an African proverb that simply because you put your hand before your eyes doesn't mean the sun has gone out. And yet you have some blacks who think that uh, in their not seeing color, the world doesn't see color, or does not see them as black. They think if they would keep uh, their incantations going on about how they are not black, and how they choose not to live a color, and how they choose not to see the world as color, that the world will not continue to treat them as black and see them as black. This is a foolish perception. It is a very childish and immature perception, which, is, of course, is, again, what oppression tends to do to oppress people. It tends to immaturize oppressed people and maintain and, and instigate a retarded development in terms of thinking in too many of our people. When we talk about this kind of thinking, we talk about this kind of thinking is occurring in children two and three and four years old who think that they can hide their eyes and, and, and by hiding their eyes, the other person disappears or goes away. Or that because they don't see the other person uh, themselves, that the other person does not see them. And you can see this foolishness, as I've suggested, on other circumstances. You go into Bensonhurst, as, as Hawkins did, or you go into Howard Beach, and you keep repeating to yourself, I'm not black, I'm not black, I don't see myself as black. And you think that those people don't see you as black. In fact, it is the keen recognition that you are black and that other people see you as black that can save your life.
because you can say, I'm black, I know how these people think about black people, and I know this neighborhood, and consequently, I will approach it this way. But you go in there singing about how we are all one, and we are all one little color, and so forth. But there, this is a part of oppression to motivate the oppressed to escape their very reality. And all it does in the end is, as we said in the Benson Hearst and so forth, leads ultimately to genocidal attacks. It is not for black people not to see color to transform the world. It is for other people, and particularly for whites, and I'm not waiting on that, not to see color. We are suffering not because we chose to see ourselves as colored or not colored, but because others see us in that vein and react to us in that vein, and it is for their perceptions to change. But again, you see, you see this old martyr complex on the part of the oppressed, thinking that letting themselves be nailed to the cross is somehow going to save the world. It only is going to get you nailed to the cross. He goes on here to say then, so there are many blacks who want to see race in purely racial terms, just as a means uh, belonging to a group who have in common a certain skin color and other physical features. And of course, then he talks about the other side of blackness, which I will refer to a bit later. So then we should ask ourselves, are these articles coincidental why are they being published at this juncture? What function are they playing within the political establishment? What is this concept of identity and of self? What is this concept of individuality? What is an individual anyway? We don't spend enough time thinking about that. One of the things that we must debunk immediately is the idea that a person can be completely individual and separated completely from society. In fact, individuality has no meaning other than in a society. If you are in the world completely alone, no one else existed, why would you even think about individuality? There's, there's no meaning whatsoever. Why would you even think about identity, race, or anything else? These things come to have meaning and operate within a social context. The concept of personal and social identity takes on meaning relative to other people, relative to a social system. Identity by its very nature is a social concept. It is no way you're going to escape the social in your personality. One's identity begins before he or she is even born. It begins in the womb itself. The society begins to shape the personality from the very first moment of conception. However one's identity is defined and assigned, however such an identity is expressed, it has social ramifications and produces social effects. Because one acts one's identity out within a social system. I don't care how you define it. If you're living in a society, it has social effects and social influences. Individual definition and expression is achieved within the social structure. Self-identity is confirmed by repeated and relatively consistent social interactions. To have an identity means that you have some kind of boundaries around your mental and physical personality. Those boundaries have to be defined relative to those outside of those boundaries. Those boundaries are maintained by those structures and people outside. In fact, one does not achieve an identity in the fullest sense until that identity is confirmed by other people. You know, you can say, I am the king, if you want to. 
You can say it all you want to, but until others defer to you and bow to your presence and follow your, follow your command, in reality, you're not. It takes the behavior and attitude and the relations of other people to confirm what you may even call an individual identity. They have to relate to you in some particular set of ways. The idea then that you can have an identity unconfirmed, unrelated to a social system is, is totally illogical. This man who says he is neither black nor white will still turn around and call himself a singer, which requires what? An audience, people to listen, people to buy records, people to respond to him as what? A singer. If he were in the middle of the forest, totally alone, what difference would it make if he sang or not? How could he define himself? The word singer, the word dancer, only has meaning within a social political context. It's just like the context people talk about of being independently wealthy. How are you, how are you gonna be independently wealthy? These are my dollars. A dollar is nothing but a printed piece of paper. That is all it is in essence. The dollar is a social instrument and its value must be accepted by other people. Therefore, it can never belong to you alone. It only has value because it is a social instrument. You never own it by yourself, for yourself, and to yourself. If you did, it would not be accepted as what? Money. But of course, the bourgeois society wants to create this so that it can make the poor and these other people it rips off think that they do not give meaning to wealth and riches. And that ultimately, what we call wealth and what we call riches is a creation of the group, not of some person who lifts him or herself up by their bootstrap and who is a self-made person. A self-made person is self-made within a social context and is maintained in their wealth by a social context. And therefore, all of the money that they have ultimately is money that belongs to the group and is a group creation. But of course, we want to run a game on your head to take your money, use all of your money, use it against you, saying it's all mine and I'm independently wealthy. <laughs> you know, we never think about, you know, and, and there's so many other concepts like private property, total thievery. You never own any property. You just rent it. You said you paid for it. You finished your mortgage. Stop paying your taxes. <laughs> See how long you got it. And watch the group take it right back from you. You don't own it. You just rent it. You see? But this is the game that's running in the mind of people. What makes an individual, what makes us individual is our unique ways of integrating and expressing and relating to community, to shared social knowledge, techniques, resources, and values. The material we individualize is in essence social material made available by a social system, a set of social relations. In other words, we are individual in our individual ways of dealing with social things and relating to social things, not that we are uniquely individual. Then we would speak our own language. You want to know that you want to really see the ultimate individual? Look at the schizophrenic in full bloom. Has his own glossolalia, salad language, living in his own total reality disembodied, doesn't know where his body ends or begins. You know, he's all people and every people. An echo chamber, so everybody he meets, he echoes them. You know, he can't distinguish himself from anything else there. Locked in his own world, locked away from reality. And therefore, he cannot, he, he has to now 
be taken care of by others because he becomes a danger to himself and sometimes others. As I said earlier, the social system is not out there. It is within each of us. The individual is a social creation. That's why individuals in different societies differ from other individuals in other societies because they individually represent their social group. The individual helps to maintain the social situation and helps to maintain the social situation. If you are so individual, why then does social disintegration, the disintegration of a social system leads so often to individual disintegration. People beginning to lose their minds, beginning to lose their sense of self, their sense of direction and purpose and meaning when the society itself becomes unraveled. People committing suicide during depressions and other things when jobs are lost. All of those self-made people and self-determining people all of a sudden come in a loose when the social system itself begins to fall apart. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that social structure that builds the infrastructure of the individual. And now you're going to have some jokers who want to come along and try to make you think that you can be a person totally unto yourself and that the essence of freedom represents atomized individuals operating with no relationship to community and no communal obligations and so forth. What purpose does this kind of approach serve? We have to ask ourselves that. Those who are talking about themselves now as individuals, those such as Julius Lester, who sees being black as some form of social fascism. And I remember Julius quite well. Look out, white, black power's gonna get your mama. You know, and that other kind of, heavy into black, wasn't he? Used black, caught up in black. And it's interesting now, once he's achieved what being black got for him, he turns around and denies it. That's why we felt disappointed with Clarence Thomas and the other people. You're going to use it. You're going to gain the fruits from the use of blackness. You're going to get your job from the how demanding quotas and other things in terms of blackness, not everybody-ness, but blackness. And now you're going to turn around and tell us that blackness has nothing to do with it and it's not important. Interestingly, it was as, it was as a common identity, as imposed sometimes as, sh as shared oppression, culture, politics, social behavior, acting against oppression, which to a significant degree has brought us to the present impasse. We have gotten people then who want to equate atomistic individualism with freedom. I would say, to a good degree, we're seeing this kind of thing going on in the black community, particularly by some individuals in the black community, because we perhaps didn't notice that these seeds were already a part of the so-called civil rights movement, but they were hidden by our focus and our attention on achieving our so-called civil rights and by our dealing with our obvious oppression. For many blacks, if I can recall, who fought during that time were fighting for what they call individualism and were equating individualism with freedom. Many, we realize now then, were fighting to identify with their aggressor. As Paulo Freire says, for many of the oppressed, to be free means to be like the oppressor. And consequently, there were many of us during that struggle who thought that white folks and their behavior and attitudes, their privileges and so forth, represented what it means to be free. 
without realizing that if to be free is to be like one's oppressor, then the day that one becomes like one's oppressor, one becomes self-oppressing. And one becomes an ally in the oppression of one's own people. And again, in black-on-black -black violence, this is what I'm saying, that the black-on-black -black violent criminal, in a sense, becomes an ally of white racism. He wants to imitate the murderous attitudes of the white man, the white man being the greatest murderer the world has ever seen, the greatest killer, robber, and rapist the world has ever known. Yes. I used to hear you say you want your children to be just like them without thinking. Our enslavers, the assassinators of our personality, those people who lynched us, those people who deprived us, those people who killed nations and nations of Indians and others, those people who wherever they stepped on this earth, the local populations were degraded, those people who developed great death machines and polluted the earth and the world itself, those killers and murderers is what we desired to be like and represented to, to many of us what it means to be free. When you take upon yourself that definition of what it means to be free, there is no wonder then that we engage in the killing of ourselves. When we identify with killers, and identify with people who kill us, then we ultimately must engage in suicide and self-destruction. And this is often what has happened. There were too many who read freedom to being, being like white folk. And they fought then the oppression that was coming to us all not to transform a system and not to reduce the power of an oppressive group, but to gain the right to more closely identify with their oppressors. Many were fighting using the concept of blackness not so much to identify with us but to dissociate themselves from us. And that's almost sort of hidden in this concept of once we gain our great freedom, people would not see us as colored. They would look at us as some form of abstraction. Why can't people see you in your reality? If you are black or whatever color you are, why can't not people see you as you are? Why is it that we demand that they play some kind of perceptual trick on themselves and not see us in our reality and in the color we present to them since they have color cones in their eyes designed to see color and then deal with us honestly and fairly. Have we bought the idea then that if people see us in our true color that they are bound to mistreat us. This leads us to the idea then that it is our color that is the cause of our oppression and not the madness and insanity of others who are oppressing us. And therefore, when you internalize this kind of concept, you see freedom as dissociating yourself from your color and trying to get others not to look at your colored reality, so that both can be insane. So that another, the other who's looking cannot see you for who you are, and you cannot see yourself for who you are. And therefore, there were those who fought as black people in order not to be seen as black people. The very essence of schizophrenia, again, and madness, is dissociation. A, a cutting off of the individual from his reality and a form of alienation. There were other of us who fought and, and fell behind the black banner during the civil rights era 
not as Malcolm, as uh, Maddox tells us, I think very importantly here, Attorney Maddox, not so much for civil rights as for consumer rights. And it becomes sort of interesting that the civil rights struggle centered around lunch counters and retail stores. And you begin to realize that while this certainly was not the whole of civil rights, that there was an aspect having to do with consumption, the right to take our money and give it to people who hated our guts. And we see this still going on today. And again, we talk about this in black on black violence. People don't want to live next to you, hate the sight of you, miseducate the children, want to continue their oppression. And then what do we do? Beat each other up so that we can carry our money to them, buy the bus loads, and feel proud of ourselves and feel good after we've given it to them. And then we'll say, why are you doing that? It's my right as a United States citizen. <laughs> I'm telling you, you look at it very closely and you will see to a great extent many of the rights that we claim we have were really set up in a way so that the white community could get greater access to black resources and money. And watch, as we became desegregated, we engage in the wholesale disinvestment of the black community. And to a great extent, it was a result of getting caught up in these consumer rights, which is another game, by the way, to buy what I want, when I want it, as an expression of freedom. Watch that concept. I was talking to one man here in Chicago who was complaining about his daughter being mistreated by his white neighbors, he being the only black one in the neighborhood. What can I do about that? That's right. <laughs> oh, no, but it's my right to live where I want to live. And, you know, this is the expression of my right. And it's interesting that when we get through defining our rights, it almost always means carrying our money to white folk and giving our resources to white folk. But the ultimate thing that it means is that white oppression did not end there, did it? His right to buy into a neighborhood made his oppression even more clear. He bought his children into even more naked oppression by the very rights that he thought he had won and that he thought he was exercising. And to a great extent, the black community had run into that impasse. After getting all the fair housing laws and all of the lunch counter laws and the desegregation laws and the other laws passed, we were fit to be free at last. And yet we look up and where are we? Suffering, still talking about what? The miseducation of our children still talking about criminality in our communities, still talking about disease running rampant, still talking about poverty and unemployment. It was as the French says, the more things change, the more they what? Remain the same. We begin to realize then that this freedom of consumption was not liberation. You have to recognize then and we must recognize that there's a difference in class consciousness and individualized consciousness. And what is going on here today is an attempt to impose on black people an individualized consciousness and to make us believe that by being totally free and disconnected as individuals, we will be free as a people. That is the very opposite of what is going to occur. The more we push, for our own unique individual freedom, the more we will come under the domination and oppression of others as a group. There is no ultimate individual freedom, ladies and gentlemen, as black people, if there is not group freedom. The powerless individual is not seen as an individual anyway. That is why we talk about what? Stereotyping. 
That is why the slave master, our master calls us what? Field hands, not individuals, workers, laborers, because there is what? A category of people there. We only bother to individualize those who are powerful. Individual freedom is made possible by group freedom and by group power. It is the power of the group that provides room for individual expression. Powerless groups do not have individual expression and are not perceived as individual. If you want to get the maximum of individual expression and freedom, you must maximize your group power and strength in the world. Quickly here, quoting Michael Parenti, businessmen collectively constitute the most class-conscious group in American society. As a class, they are more highly organized, more easily mobilized, have more facilities for communication, are more like-minded, and are more accustomed to stand together in defense of their privileges than any other group. And yet this is the group that depends on the consumption of our people. The ruling class is different from the subordinate classes, not only in terms of possessing more wealth. So we like to think that rich people are rich only because they have more money. Watch that. And more power and more prestige. But more importantly, in terms of their ownership of the means of production and their concern with production and their desire to conserve, expand, and increase these factors. The rich own the means of production and concern themselves with maintaining that ownership and expanding that ownership and controlling that ownership. This is a very important difference between rich and poor. It's just not more money and less money. This ownership and these concerns on the part of the ruling group induces in them a class consciousness, a group solidarity and action orientation, markedly different from their lower class counterparts. Under capitalism, ruling class power and wealth is to a very significant degree founded on the consumerism of the subordinate classes. And consequently, the subordinate classes must be socialized into consumerism, not socialized into production, but socialized into what? Consumption. This is why again and again, I try to get across to people that one of the essences of an African-centered education is that the African-centered education is designed not to just see that you're better qualified to get jobs, to take advantage of opportunity offered by other people. You see, African-centered education rejects the market definition of why people are being educated in the first place. It, because when we talk about making our children qualified and, and getting them prepared to take advantage of opportunities, we are also making the assumption that the opportunities that are being offered are not being offered by us. We are still assuming that the ownership of jobs and opportunity will be in the hands of other people. And I've asked people before, what makes you assume that the jobs will even be there? What makes you assume that whites will even offer you the job? Therefore, it is not enough for you to merely get an edu education, merely to read better, merely to go to the right schools. You are still making an assumption that those other people will offer you the jobs and give you the opportunities merely because you're qualified. And African-centered education involves itself then not with the mere qualification of, of our people and not with the mere preparation of them to take advantage of opportunities, but it must prepare them to create opportunities and to create jobs and to create ownership and to be productive, not consumers only. You see, that means then that African people have to achieve a whole different type of consciousness than is present today in our community. 
That is why I talk about African-centered education as having an intentionality, and it is that intentionality that transforms the education of black people. What do you intend to do? Not what has happened to you, not what you are missing, not the idea that your children are not reading as well, or they're not doing math as well. That is not the stimulus for African-centered education. The stimulant for African-centered education is what do we want as a people and how are we going to get it and what are our intentions in the world? And how then are we going to educate our children so that those intentions can be fulfilled and actualized as a people? Because what did I tell you before? Colin Powell knows how to read well, and yet he reads, he uses his reading capacity to bomb and destroy black people. So it's not enough to teach them to read well. Other black mathematicians have worked on U.S. projects, nuclear research and bombs and so forth, so that they may be dropped on African population. Ronald McNair and others were learned in physics. And what were they being used to do? To seed space with weapons so that the United States could intimidate African nations and destroy African nations from four and 500 miles out in space. It is not enough to get your children just to read well and know math well. They must read for a reason. They must read for an African reason and purpose. There must be an African intentionality involved in their learning to read and write and to do mathematics. If they are not being educated merely to make more money so that they can spend more money. They, you will never spin yourself out of oppression. As a matter of fact, again referring to the black on black violence, through our habits of consumption, we actually finance our oppression. Yes. We enrich our oppressors, increase their wealth, increase their power, and we create and maintain within ourselves a consciousness that maintains our oppression. We be, are so caught up in the consciousness of consumerism that we commit violence against one another in order to engage in consumer behavior. We sell poison to our children. We corrupt our communities. We disinvest the wealth of our communities. And we think that this is an expression of freedom and this is an expression of wealth and status. And this means that we, since we consume equally to white folk, since we drive the same cars as white folk, live in the same houses, the same neighborhood as white folk, we are the same as white folks, you are foolish. It is that very sameness that is maintaining the inequality. I was trying to explain to my class the other evening the confusion people have of, uh, of uh, equating sameness with equality. You want your children to have the same education as white children. Then if you do, you want them to stay oppressed. Yes. You don't want them to be educated in terms of their unique history. You don't want them to be educated in terms of their learning styles. You don't want them to be educated in terms of the problems they have to solve for themselves. You don't want them to be educated in terms of the reality of the fact that they are oppressed, not white children. No, you want them educated as if they were white children. That is the surest way to maintain oppression, to ignore one's reality and to be educated out of sync with one's reality. The black man today is being educated to solve white folks' problems and to get status when he solves their problem. Yes. And sees himself as successful when he solves a problem for them. And you still can't get that same one to work on a single problem in the black community. As a matter of fact, he's at a loss as to how to use his talents and knowledge in the interest of black folk. Speaking of individual definition, his job loses definition once it steps outside of the white context. His self-definition, which is tied to his job definition, is lost. I've told you before, black people even define intelligence in terms of solving problems for white folk. 
The consumerism of our people then, as stated by Parenthood, the socialization of people into consumerism served to retard class consciousness. By consumerism, I'm quoting Parenthood here, I am referring to the tendency to treat consumption the consumption and accumulation of goods and services as a central purpose of life. And consumption is, not, is, not, is no longer just a means to life, but a meaning for life itself. And we can see this in the, in the statistics of black people. This endless comparison of black income with white income. What percentage of black people earning of white income? As if that is the most important index of black freedom. Not what percentage of America do black people own. What percentage of the means of production do black people own? What kind of military and other kind of power do black people own compared to white folk? No, that's not even dealt with. What income do you have compared with white folk? And as I've told you before, there's a difference between income and wealth. Because you may make $100,000 or $200,000 a year, does not mean that you're equally as wealthy as another person who may be have an income of 100,000 or 200,000 because they own $10 million worth of property. The person is worth $10 million. You are worth your monthly salary. Why do not we then compare wealth and the ownership of real estate? Why do we merely compare what? Income which to a good extent is an index of consumption, not an index of ownership, not an index of power, not an index of control. And yet we are given these statistics over and over again. And therefore, we have a consciousness of people who concentrate on income instead of wealth, consumption instead of production. And then you want to think because you got a salary equal to white folk that you're equal as wealthy. You got another thought coming. Consumerism is more than an attitude arising from personal greed. It is a mode of social behavior functional to capitalistic society. The corporate need is to produce more, to sell more, to profit more, to produce more, and so on endlessly. Under capitalism, the, the acquisitive impulse is not merely indulged, it is constantly instigated and developed into a life imperative that cannot easily be put to rest, a psychology of moreness, knowing no end. In other words, once you get into this consumption mode, it's hard to get out of it. How many of you fighting your children about these Christmas gifts? And they've been pounded through the year and now at this point with all kinds of advertising. And this is another difference I have to talk about. When I was growing up, you know, you got what parents bought you. And the commercial market was pretty much projected toward adults. But now you have a, com a commercial market that is highly segmented, that advertises not to adults only, but that advertises to specific segments in the society, all the way from older people, what do they spend, what are their habits. So you, you set this ad up this way if you want to get them. The mid-range, mid-age uh, group, the adolescent, young adult group, what kind of music do they listen to? What kind of language do they use? What kind of taste do they have? So we want to set the ad up so that we can talk directly to them. But it doesn't stop only at adolescents. It talks about what? Children. Well, children from four to five or five to 10 are a $3 billion market. They are a market even though they're not working. <laughs> they're not earning money, but they are a market because they know that these little kids can worry mom and daddy to death. And mom and daddy are gonna do what? buy those gifts. And therefore, the little ads are directly shot, directly at them. They internalize them and express them in their attitudes and behavior toward their parents. And their parents are influenced by it, and the money goes out. And it's hard, once you get into it, to stop it. This is what we're talking about. It becomes what? Imperative. You can't cut it off. It's like trying to cut off a smoking habit or something. 
Thus the attention and energies of people in capitalist society becomes decidedly privatized. Consequently, while the socialization of the owning class members is designed to foster class loyalties and cohesions, the socialization of the propertyless move with opposite effect. We can see it going in, in opposite direction. Thus, the development of the working class consciousness is retarded because all of them are caught up in their individual consumption and concern. And yet, we're talking about businessmen, businesswomen, the corporate you know, group, the business establishment, but we hesitate to talk about groups of others on the lower level. Once again, we see that power is used not only to pursue interest, but to define interest, which is another power that the wealthy and the rich and the owners of production have that the, that the consumer does not have, to define interest. Again, in Black on Black Violence, I talk about there in Chapter 8, desiring production of how tastes are created by the system and how, in a sense, those things that we own as black people are devalued by the system, and only those things that have value are things owned by the other people. And their advertising establishment and their media creates a taste for everything that you don't have and that you can't make for yourself. That's the only way it can work. How did you gain the taste? for what you have today. And I talk about that there. I talked about the crack industry, right? That it is the taste and addiction of the crack addicts that maintains the whole infrastructure of the crack industry. That it is the manipulation of, that de of their desire that is the engine that runs the whole thing. That is why the pusher, as pusher, may give away drugs free at the beginning. To do what? Create what? Desire. To produce what? Desire. And desire once produced. And now since he has the desired products, he now lives off the desire that he's created. And we are all addicts as oppressed people. Watching our oppressors create our desires and what's being created in us, it's our desires that maintain the system. And that group then has a media organization. It has media organizations, not individuals, what? Organizations. Corporation is what? A body. Company is a what? Body. These are what? Groups. But then they'll tell us to act as what? Individuals. They go to work and coordinate their activities. They dress within certain limitations. They talk certain sort of ways. They write certain sort of ways. They express certain types of outlook. They go to school for years so that they can be appropriately shaped to talk, walk, dress, write, perceive the world so that they can fit into what? An organization and a body so they can fleece the other individuals in the world. This is what it's about. But then they're going to make you think to think in terms of blackness, to operate in terms of blackness is unusual, is odd, and it's wrong. But of course, what I say, things have to be backwards, don't they? This is the nature of things. Again, speaking about class the other night, you know, to get engaged in black studies is something bad. But what have you been studying? White studies? We make the mistake of thinking that what is white is universal than what is black. And yet, this defies the reality. There are more of us colored folk and non-white folk in the world than white folk. Why do we then continue to perceive whiteness as representing greater universality than blackness? But it has to be that way in front of this small group to win. So their psychologies don't become white psychology. They just become what? Developmental psychology. 
And of course, the person reads into that then that this psychology, since this is not prefixed by a racial term, must be more universal. The education that they provide in these schools is not called white Eurocentric education, it's called what? Standard education. And again, people are taken in to believe that then what is offered in white schools is somehow more universal and race neutral. You see, if it were so race neutral, then why does it seem to maintain that race in the position that it is in? I'll be through shortly here. So the power of the ruling class is used to create taste. One quotation from Tillich, modern capitalism is the manifestation of the war of all against all, accepted as principle, and we bought that. The idea that people are always going to be at war against each other as individuals. Hence, an activity motivated always by the impulse to seek one's interests at the expense of others. The peculiarly demonic element in the situation of capitalist society is this, that conflict is not the expression of individual arbitrariness or of chaotic anarchy, but is necessarily bound up with the maintenance of the capitalist economic system and as a result of that system itself. Let me go back with this. Those people who talk about individualism and privatized consumption and going only for themselves are not really expressing individualism. They have internalized the strongest social and group ideology of all. In other words, it is the ideology of isolated individualism. It is, the it is the ideology of unconstrained consumption, consumption unrelated to group purpose and ends, consumption unrelated to community, that is the most communal of ideologies because it does what? Maintains whom? The white community. You see? In other words, as I've said, we've got to be backwards again. In expressing our so-called individuality as black people, we have been duped to, his, to the greater extent, and we are acting most within a group concept because it is that concept imposed upon the oppressed that maintains the power of the oppressor and is the source of the oppressor's wealth and of his power. That is why the more you spend unrelated to community ends and unrelated to community purpose, the poorer we get. The more oppressed we become, the more unemployed we become, you see. The idea of individualized consumption unconnected to community is one of the most political and economical ideas we can engage in. That's why we have to look at it very closely. And that's why the more individualized you become in your consumption, the more disconnected you become in your behavior and attitudes, the more, as I said earlier, we will feel the brunt of oppression and the more the power of others will increase over us. We are not going to spend ourselves out of oppression and by giving our money to our oppressors. The right to spend money anywhere, any place is not an expression of freedom, but really a part of enchaining ourselves ever more closely to our oppressive conditions. So looking at these facts and looking at the fact that our fundamental conditions have not changed, that we've actually gotten worse in many instances, 
we began to question this philosophy, not that we hadn't been questioning it all along, but we had people with this other ideology overlaying us, and I'm, by us I'm talking about nationalist. Black nationalism reasserted its influence as Afrocentrism, placed new demands on the social system and on all black Americans. These demands stimulated, and this is what's going on here, why are, these, why are we all of a sudden having crisis in identity? At the very moment, we also talked about what? Afrocentrism and African what? Centeredness. So right at this moment, when we are beginning to coalesce and to develop a concept of African identity and Afrocentrism, we are all now suddenly in a what? Identity crisis. Is the identity crisis really there, or is what going on an attempt to do what? Create an identity crisis. Because these people are well aware of what a full and wholesome identity will do to them. And they are aware that an African-centered identity represents the end of white power and of white oppression. That's why I've told you time and time again that at the center of an African-centered education is the overthrow of white power and the breaking of the arms of white power. If you're not educating your children to break white people's power over us, you're miseducating them if not at the very center of the education of our children, is a preparing of them to defeat and destroy white power over us, then you're engaged in an education for servants. You can call it by any name you want to. You can call it multiculturalism. You can even call it Afrocentrism. But if its goal does not have at the center of it the destruction of white folks' power over black folk, and the destruction of any other ethnic group's power over black folk, then you're not talking about African-centered education. And ultimately, you're not talking about liberation. You have to keep that in mind. That is a part of it. And that kind of consciousness places new demands on black folk and on this system. So you have some black folk then hearing about Afrocentrism Fear, resegregation. In fact, they'll call it what? Self segregation. These other groups, by the way, who live together and want to stay in their own neighborhoods, fight you and burn your house down when you move in, move their children out so they can keep their children to themselves and educate their children, you know, all of these things. And as a result thereof, you see they have their power and they have control and they have wealth and everything, and then you have some Negro saying, segregation of the group represents failure. <laughs> it's an amazing situation. And I'm gonna show you a minute what's going on in this area. But again, it's because they bought the individualistic philosophy, because to a good extent, a resegregation for them represents material loss. They fear that the so-called gains in social freedoms that they have achieved, that the so-called successful blacks and the wannabe blacks want to achieve, will be taken from them. And consequently, the more we demand an African-centered consciousness and an African-centered approach to the world, the more they want to dissociate themselves from blackness. I'm not like the rest of them folk over there. Let me in. They fear black power, of course. White people fear black power. If we gain an African-centered consciousness, it means a loss of the black consumer dollar by whites and other non-blacks. And what have I told you before? Because we are such individuals, because we are so free, we, in a sense, are financing Koreans and other children. We are making certain that they don't engage in crime because they don't have to. In a sense, we finance or we disinvest in our own children. And to that extent, we actually instigate criminality in our own. 
those of us who don't see color means that we don't see our own children of color. We treat all people the same, even though in reality not all people are the same. Not all white children as a group are equally as poor as black children. But yet you want to see them as the same, and in the end, you end up giving what? Money to people who already have more than they know what to do with. We finance the children of other groups, and then we wonder why our own engage in thievery and other forms of misbehavior. In a sense, then, we create it. We also see a situation here with the changing demographics of this country, the need of this country to what I call Anglo-Saxonize the black middle class, to make honorary blacks as a means of maintaining their position and their power and their wealth when they are no longer even a majority in the United States to create a neoconservative black class to reward its neoconservatism and move the society from racism to classism. So all of a sudden, this society is not going to be so much based on race as it is on class. And that should make the Marxists happy. <laughs> you know, now, we can talk about class, because these neo-honorary blacks now become a part of the middle class and the upper ruling class, even though they are not. The black middle class and the black upper class is a subordinate class. It is an underclass. What did I say about this distinction? Because these two classes still don't own anything in this country worth a nickel. They don't own the means of production. This is a salaried class. This is not a real ruling and upper class. This is a misnomer to call these people such. They are still managed by the white middle class. They're still being laid off by white middle class managers out there today. We are, it, it is still a, a, an underclass, but you're going to create this idea of equating these Negroes with being white and say so they're in the same class with white folk. You're not in the same class with white folk. I don't care how you dress, how you talk, how you walk, what school you go to, and, and uh, how you look at the world. In fact, as I've often said, I wouldn't regret it too much if black people really acted like white folk. You know what I'm saying? Yes. In fact, I've said that Farrakhan and others act more like white folk, if you want to play it that way, than Clarence Thomas, or the black conservative. Why? Because white folks say they want to what? Own and control a piece of this what? This earth and this ground. They want to own their neighborhoods. They want to own their businesses. They want to educate their own children. They want real power in the world. They build real nations and so forth. They have their own institutions. They create their own jobs. So man, if you want to act like a white folk person, go at it. You see? But these Negroes you accuse of acting white are acting just what they are, Negroes. <laughs> if we really acted like white folk, we would be at war right now. We would be in the business of taking from them the wealth that they have stolen. We wouldn't be concerned with obeying their laws and their rules and all of this business. We would get it the way they got it. Reach in and what? Take it. And then impose our own what? Rules and laws and legitimize our own criminality. <laughs> That's what white folk do. You go to white schools and they still don't teach you to be white. No, you think you're going to Yale teaching you to be white? You're being taught to be a bigger Negro than ever. <laughs> Just the fact that you at that school should teach you something. Where's your own? Where's your research universities? How are you going to protect yourself against the onslaught of AIDS and other disease? Using your own research institutions, using your own hospitals, using your own defense establishment against germ warfare and so forth. You're not being taught to act like white folk. Don't act like Negroes. So the Afrocentrism invoked in whites and among blacks a need 
and uh, in, uh, particularly among whites, for a degraded black mass to maintain its social cohesion and economic dominance. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, this whole social system is maintained by the degradation of black people. That is why Afrocentrism and African identity is so frightening to the system. This is why a communal identity is so frightening to the system. I've indicated to you earlier that it is this privatized consumer approach to the world that maintains it. When people start then spending their money responsibly in terms of themselves and in terms of their self-development and not just throwing it over to other people, when people start behaving in terms of their communal development and power, when another community has depended upon our being divided and dependent upon our, our acting as individuals unconnected one to the other, then our coming together and creating a community and creating a single consciousness represents the end of that destruction and the end of that power. So at the point when we begin to develop this, we suddenly get an identity crisis. It was stated in the Time magazine uh, very clearly that the, the development of ethnic pride in non-white people threatened the social cohesion of America because it was the lack of that pride that maintained it. So then, as we'll end it here, and I just want to look and mention just some other things here. And again, I say it's good to look at the format of things and look at the timing of things. At the same time that we are having a so-called identity crisis in the black community, and at the same time we are, we are accused of engaged in being engaged in racial fascism and so forth, at the same period, it's interesting that you get a whole spate of articles in these very same papers that talk about the great ethnic growth and development of other groups. Again, in the living section of the New York Times, Wednesday, December 11, 1991, along 90 blocks of New Jersey, a new world of Latin taste. Is it wrong for these people? I don't see any condemnation of this group of people. 90 blocks. And it goes on and on for page after page, talking about this unpeeling the multiple strata of Latin cultural lore on Bergen Line Avenue, and how this avenue, Bergen Line Avenue, which extends for 90 blocks through Union City and West New York, just across the Hudson from Manhattan, and what great delights you will experience when you go over there, what great foods and so forth, what, uh, what a great essence of culture that we will experience when there, uh, when you go over there and how this population is increasing the fast, uh, faster than any other population in New Jersey, to shop and eat along the avenue where English is seldom spoken, is to cover thousands of miles and a half a dozen diverse Latin cultures in an afternoon. Where is the condemnation of the ethnic identity here? And what do we see the result of this, uh, what do we see this ethnic identity resulting in? People creating opportunities for themselves. People creating jobs for themselves. People creating wealth for themselves. People creating uh, economic and political power for themselves. Why aren't they not having an identity crisis? And why is their identity uh, so great while our identity is so bad? Another paper, same time, Tim, I'm talking in the same time frame, just to show you the contradiction here. December 7, wider mosaic, suburbs, long job, suburbs, jobs, luring immigrants. They talk about Terrytown, 40% of the population, Latino, openly talking about how they're going to take political power in this part of, uh, of uh, New York City. Not negativity there. Same papers, New York Times, December 2nd, McDonald's rich Taiwanese backer. Here we have here, you know, on the nook of the 29th floor, a new office building in this city. It's a two-month-old company whose 40 employees scribble memos, hold meetings, receive guests, but have, have not yet manufactured a single product. 
Now the novice company is raising eyebrows in a few tempers with a plan to pay as much as $2 billion for a large chunk of McDonnell Douglas Corporation. McDonnell Douglas Corporation being the largest U.S. military contractor. How is this coming together, ladies and gentlemen? Because people are acting as individuals? They're buying 40% of this company. Because there's an individual investor here? No. The Taiwan Aerospace Corporation is no fly-by-night operation, rather the high-priority venture of a government with $76 billion in foreign exchange reserved more than any other nation. So coming together as a group, with the consciousness of a group, they come to own American production facilities and American wealth. Same paper talking about an identity crisis in the black community. What do we have going on here? One more we talk, but I just want you to look over the total paper sometimes. Just don't read stories. Look at the total design of the paper and see the contradictions here. Same kind of paper, Thursday, December 25th, the power of the yen winning Asia. The new cold prosperity is displacing the U.S. How the Japanese are displacing the U.S. in Asia as a major investment group there. And stated very clearly, we are investing in Asia because we share an Asian culture. And based on that shared culture, we're going to invest our money here and grow here and develop it. No, no condemnation here. Next piece, and I'll be through here December 4th. Same time all this identity crisis is occurring. The intractable trade issues with Japan evoke a sense of nation's departure. And it talks in this piece about how Japan has changed its investment from the United States and now is placing most of its investment in Asia. From 1985 through 1990, Japan made direct investments abroad of $239 billion of which $110 billion went to the United States during the same period, just $5.3 billion of direct investment entered Japan from all other sources. What? We're investing in you, but you're not what? Investing in us. $240 billion outside, and we're only letting what? $5 billion come in to us. And now we represent businesses between 1982 and 1987, a growth that equal 1,000% increase as against a black increase in business of some 38%. Representing what? Group power and group identity. And those people as individuals, because they belong to these groups who will own parts of America, who will own wealth, will be perceived and acted and related to as individuals. How can you love all children and not teach your own and love your own? Yeah, we got some people, they just love the world but they can't love their own. How can you love all colors when you cannot love your own, when you choose not to see your own color? How can you love yourself and be happy with yourself and then want to flee from yourself? How can you love to kiss your own lips and hold yourself in your own arms? Talk sweet talk to yourself, laugh at your own jokes, and then want to be someone else. How do you love all mankind and not love your own kind? Aren't we mankind as well? How if you don't know how to love yourself? How would you know how it feels to love yourself? How would you know how to love someone else if you do not know how to love yourself? And how do you know and how it truly feels to be in love and to love if you cannot feel love for yourself and your own. How dare you talk about love? How can you create universal harmony and unity when there is disharmony in your family and disunity in your community, but yet you're going to harmonize the world? You may not know who you are, but the world knows you. You may not know your name, but the world has given you one, whether you answer to it or not. There is only one way to go, ladies and gentlemen, and that's the way of reclaiming our African selves and our African minds. And in that way, we reclaim, 
our African sanity, and our African power. Thank you very much. For your time. Brothers and sisters, uh, I had an experience uh, a month or so ago that helped me to even more appreciate what it is that we had today. I went to a conference called uh, the Black Males Conference, and Dr. Poussant, and I name his name just because I've seen him do this a couple of times, was asked to come and present. And he came, and literally he presented nothing. I mean, he presented absolutely nothing. And people had paid their money to do this. Here we are, most of us came in for free because we're some OTAP members, and Brother Amos Wilson came. Not only was the information that he has superior to that nonsense that Poussin has learned at Harvard, but the brother took the time to prepare it, to organize it, to think about it, to think of it in real depth, and he had so much that he wanted to give us until like he was just trying to cram it in in the end. I mean, we were blessed today, and let's give another a round of applause. As a matter of fact, I, the designation of races and classes and, and groups uh, to me is, is very much connected to, to economic power and the maintenance of economic power and economic advantage because they generally too tend to, to be correlated with um, economic standing that is, group names, group designations, and attitudes are related to group standing and power in the world. And to a great extent, these designations are not only designations in terms of colorations, but designations in terms of privilege and advantage relative to, of course, the top of that pyramid. They serve often in protecting their own privilege, that is those secondary groups, to maintain, of course, the power and the strength of the primary group. And in the end, of course, they define themselves economically and in every other way almost in terms of that uh, primary group. So you can see the primary group organizing its definition of them and reorganizing its definition of them in terms of its own economic motives. This is also true in terms of specific personality characteristics as well, which I emphasize even to a greater extent, that if you would look into the, uh, the modal character, the so-called average character of our people, and many of the things that we complain about in terms of the way we behave or act in the world, you will recognize that they have economic outcomes and purposes. Uh, if we talk about, for instance, the lack of so-called self-confidence, I've indicated how the lack of self-confidence in our people reduces entrepreneurial spirit in our, black, in our folk. And therefore, the breeding of a lack of self-confidence becomes a way of knocking us out of economic competition with other people, while at the same time trying to state that we are free to compete. Or the degrading of black physiognomy, making us feel um, uh, unattractive, uh, motivates us actually to buy white cosmetics from white companies. And of course, uh, say in the case of Michael Jackson and others, to actually engage perhaps in um, surgical operation and other procedures that also enrich other, other people. Uh, the idea of defining oneself purely in terms of consumption, as I stated here earlier, not relating to uh, consumption, not relating one's consumption to uh, race, also implies maintaining the race that owns the means of production and owns the resources in power and so forth. So you will see these definitions, whether they are of race, whether they are of characteristics, whether they are stereotypical labels 
ultimately devolving back to some type of political, economic, or other kind of advantage for other people. And in that context, one of the ways of reading these papers and one of the ways of reading the behavior of oppressors, the labeling behavior, as I was saying today, the publishing of articles that talk about us, is to ask the question, in what way uh, is this talking about us? Or in what way uh, is this writing about us ultimately designed to maintain their group advantage? What kind of mentality are they trying to maintain or create as a way of maintaining themselves? Because ultimately, at the, the thing that runs through all of these labeling processes, uh, this designation processes, ultimately the thing that runs through them all is an attempt for the group that's doing the naming and making the designations to maintain its power over the consciousness and ultimately over the behavior of those named. Any other questions for <clears throat> But then it's one of the things that I think in uh, Robinson's hand, too, is mm -hmm. just right in keeping what you're saying, is that it, it's a, a way to be able to sell your own children. Do I want to me? A way to sell your own children. Mm -hmm. So a, a planter has uh, a child, mm -hmm. and he can get more benefit by selling that child, but not if he, not if he acknowledges his child, so he labels it an octa room. So it reminds me about market definition when we tell our children why they should get an education. And often you get the statement uh, so that they can make themselves more marketable. <laughs> and we sort of talk about education as a tool, uh, the means by which we can sell ourselves. You see, again, and if you look at the way after we define ourselves and define our education, it's defined along market terms. And so you do, again, have that commercial, economic aspect uh, to definition and in terms of power. Yes, ma'am. Um, Professor Amos, uh, my question has to do with the population of black males. And I hope you can answer it. It's probably one that the research that I haven't done. And I hope you can shed some light on it. We read uh, continuously about the extinction of the black male, the destruction of the black male, the disappearing black male. And this is psychologically very damaging for, for Africans to continue to hear this. Do you or anyone that you know of actually have actual figures, comparative figures, on the black male population? Is the black male population disappearing as we are continuously told? Or what is actually happening with that subpopulation? I don't have any figures other than what would be available to me, and I'm not saying they're not around, than what would be available to me from the, the, the Census Bureau. Because frankly, I have not uh, researched those, uh, those figures. Uh, however, I think when people talk about the disappearing black male and so forth, or the extension of the black male, they are in part referring to the tremendous increase in homicidal deaths, you see, uh, from say maybe 2,000 a year in the early 60s or something to 20,000, you know, within a relative short period of time. And the increases in suicidal death rates uh, in that vein, and those are direct death, you know, just a direct killing, direct homicide. And of course, the homicide, uh, the homicide and suicide uh, through slow motion of drugs, crack, cocaine, those uh, forms of drugs which did not exist prior to particular times. And the increasing number of black males being incarcerated in the prisons as well as the decline in the life expectancy rate of black males and black people. In fact, we, we've noted that the life expectancy rate of blacks on the average has declined instead of increased. A great deal of that decline, if not the, the very bulk of it, 
uh, had, can be accounted for through the death of black males. So uh, while I may not be able to give you an absolute number in the fullest sense, the sense of the black male uh, being endangered, being uh, in trouble, and being endangered of, um, of extinction, I think, is generated out of these kinds of figures. Uh, the like of, and the, the miseducation of black males, the misdirection of black males, unemployment and the other issues we talk about, while it may not kill black males directly, is making black males and ultimately the black group vulnerable to being killed and to death. And this is a part of the concern as well. It has removed our capacity to defend uh, the race. And so we not only talk about the endangered black male as an ongoing and current activity, but uh, as a real possibility in the future. Because looking at the history of whites, we know that these people tend to exterminate those people that they find economically useless. And of course, the Indian is the greatest illustration of that to begin with. And as we talk about black males being left out of the job market uh, and created by whites and not contributing to the white job market and not, seeing, not being seen as being of any use to whites, we can pretty much bet that following upon that evaluation, there will be a genocidal move against black people. So it's with these things in mind that we, we should talk about them, even though it does depress some people and it may in some instances be misinterpreted. Uh, it's very important, though, that we not fudge over uh, what is going on and what could possibly happen. Yes, sir. Okay, as um, we talk about society, the job that we work in as it relates to the society is also to our oppression. Now, for us that work in these jobs, what kind of position should we take as African people to move towards liberation? Being that just by working with, uh, contributing to, towards our own oppression, what can you suggest that we take? What kind of stance can we take? I'm well aware, of course, when I talk about, you know, maintaining the system of oppression and uh, the dilemma that that represents uh, for us, and of course, survival requires, at this point, that we work for our oppressors. And of course, so when I talk about this, I'm talking more in a futuristic sense. But I'm also talking about us beginning to shape a consciousness and shape a set of social relations, a, a set of relationships with others and building organizations and institutions that will transform this situation. <clears throat> and the answer is not too complicated because it really happens throughout history. And when we look at history, we see a history of where people organize themselves to take back, to protect their wealth, and to get wealth from other people, even though that's a hard reality for many of us to, to operate on. When I see blacks on jobs, and ourselves on jobs, and I'm a part of that force, you know. To me, it becomes a matter of getting to know that job, getting to know that company, getting ourselves in a relationship where we can export the intelligence of that job and about that job, uh, get ourselves in a position to take over that company if possible, to create rival companies and competitive companies as a group. Uh, even, even though some people have problems with this, organizing our communities to invest so deeply in those companies that we literally buy them or buy such a portion of them and intertwine our investment in them in such a way until they cannot uh, remove us without destroying themselves in, in the process. This, this example I mentioned about the Taiwanese, here, in a sense, these people are getting a, they're literally buying American technology through their investing in American companies, using the American investment system as a means of giving themselves access to knowledge and information provided by that system. 
both to increase their wealth, their knowledge, and their technology, because ultimately that Taiwanese company is going to transfer that information and knowledge back to Taiwan and develop an aerospace industry to compete with the United States. Now, we have African countries in the Caribbean, Central South America. We have African countries, of course, on the continent. To a good extent, I've stated to people that I think the um, Africans in America are the cog in the wheel of African technological development because we are in these companies. We are parts of these companies. We are familiar with these systems. We, the idea that African countries can start from ground zero and catch up with Asian companies and white companies technologically, I think is one that is very doubtful. However, we have the advantage that if we identify ourselves as Africans, if we can become the conduits and the means by which Africa can invest and buy into these companies, and we buy into these companies, and we build networks of companies on the continent itself related to this, and take advantage of the knowledge and technology that we have available to us on these jobs, then we can jumpstart the African nations and jumpstart Africa into the space age. So we should look at these jobs, since we are forced on them in many instances, in terms of how the knowledge, the techniques, and other things we learn from being on these jobs can be used and transferred back to African people into African hands and advance uh, African economic, social, and political development. But it would mean that you got to get, get together with your workers on that job. And you want to, many white uh, guys, for instance, move on jobs and stay on jobs merely to gain the knowledge and expertise to start their own companies. And in many instances then, we as black folk will have to come in there with that same kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, yes ma'am. <clears throat> yes, I would like to answer your question, um, but it's more I'd leave like some advice or suggestion or walk to it. Okay. All right, um, politically, like in the community that I'm in, um, I'm involved in a political party, and I'm finding that they're not really trying to empower the communities so that they could do on their own. Their focus is more on getting better jobs with the county, um, a better position, uh, like you were speaking before about, um, you know, I hope we're making this clear. You were speaking about, um, you know, buying into the consumption or the middle class values or reform values. And I'd like to know how I could change that around by being involved, because I've been nominated to be a secretary, but I like to put input into the committee, but I find when I offer some suggestions about uh, let's change the ideas, how we go about having the people to better understand how they can gain their own political rights instead of us keep continuing to beg as a community front, and also have outside communities control our areas. Like I live in, uh, you know, what's considered a black community or ghetto. But yet it's still the surrounding areas are controlling our school districts, they control the money. Um, how can I just offer suggestions or try to make some type of change within the party that I'm involved with? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'll be honest. I don't know how you can change those things. <laughs> well, it's not that They talk about strategy or how to just bring in some different types of thinking to help them to open up to see themselves. Well, you'd have, to bring in, you'd have to bring in different types of numbers. And you have to bring in more people like yourself. And you'd have to become determined if you have a different way of thinking and, and a different way of doing things, if you want to stay with that organization, then to recruit more people like yourself and make it a determined effort to take it over and to achieve power and influence and try to outnumber those that are in it. 
and move it. Uh, that is definitely one way of approaching that. As one single individual, it's going to be difficult, uh, obviously, for you to make uh, any real change in, those, in that organization. Because, of course, those people have, like many political clubs, a vested interest in maintaining the system as it is. And that means they have a vested interest in not hearing hardly anything you have to say, particularly if it's you against the rest of them. And, they are going, and since they are going to be involved in their own self-serving approaches to what they're doing. The other alternative, of course, is while you may stay a member of the group because for whatever reason you have, you may want to uh, develop alternative groups and independent groups or join, if possible, some independent political groups in the community. The, uh, many of these groups need competition. They need uh, other, uh, other political groups who oppose their position and challenge their position in the community and challenge them for leadership in the community with a platform that goes along the lines of your thinking. Uh, one of the things you see in the David Duke situation and other situations, and I've said often to black nationalists, you run for, uh, or uh, better yet, Buchanan, as he runs against uh, Bush. Now, Buchanan is not saying so much that he or he thinks he's going to win the presidency, but he figures that he's so far to the right of Bush that for Bush to succeed against him, Bush has to move farther to the right. And just the process of competing against Bush, running for office against Bush, in effect moves Bush toward him. And I've stated that as nationalists and other people then, we must provide a challenge to those standard organizations in the community, state our position very clearly, and of course, force then certain issues to be publicly discussed because you are making them public and forcing these people towards yourself. Not that you shouldn't even go for office either, if you want to, as well. I, I can understand that, but again, I'm speaking in terms of group, because these things are better done in terms of joining some kind of group. Because as an individual, it becomes pretty difficult to uh, make the kind of changes you want. There are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it, uh, uh -huh. but in the, I think is, uh, do we have uh, brother Mac here? Brother Joe Mac, who operates here in Queens? and who's a developing organization here, who ran for governor, and of, uh, at least was petitioning to run for governor in the state of New York. Uh, where's your location, Brother Mike? Uh, 190, mm -hmm. Very much uh, into politics and the kinds of things in the Afrocentric sense and in the truest sense. It is through connecting uh, people like Brother Mac here that I, you can run into some people who are truly committed to Afrocentrism and who are knowledgeable of the political system and structure and can give you the kind of support that, uh, that you're seeking. So I suggest perhaps you might want to speak with him for a minute or two since he is operating here in the borough itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Centrically uh, building up the information and knowledge 
of African culture and of your African self. That's number one. Because the greater part of that education is going to come right out of your house. And in terms of the kind of relationship you have with that child. The greater part of the African-centered education is, is going to come from the atmosphere that you create, both the emotional and social atmosphere that you create with that child, as well as the physical atmosphere that you create in terms of that child. And making African culture live in your, yourself and in that house in terms of from its very decorative nature, in terms of the books, in terms of the conversations that go on in there, in terms of the cultural events that you and he attend together uh, as such, to emerge him into the culture. Not so much to preach at him. You don't have to spend a lot of time preaching, but being, being a part of African people, African events, African culture, and exhibiting it on all the levels that you possibly can. And then, uh, and this is of course is an ongoing, never ending process that's going to go on until he's 18, 19, 20. Um, on top of that then, learning where the African centered institutions are, are programs, after school programs, or evening programs, other things like that, and introducing him to those, uh, those programs. I don't have uh, any material directly at hand. However, I do have a list of African independent schools and African centered independent schools that if you want to get in touch with me, I can let you know about where they are here in this borough so that you may want to introduce them there. But also be sure and think of yourself as his most important teacher, you see, and prepare yourself to teach the child, and you can do it. Uh, you don't need a formal credentials and all that kind of stuff. You need to uh, immerse yourself in the knowledge of your own culture and into the knowledge of history. And on top of that, build into him through your own work a high level of competence. That means mathematics, reading, and other kinds of real intellectual skills so that in gaining a sense of competence, he also gains a sense of self-esteem along with his African pride. And with those things, I don't think you should have any problems. The other thing, of course, if you can, is to associate with other African-centered uh, mothers and families like your own and bring him into contact with those as a part of his social life and, and uh, uh, his social existence. And you can in, get in contact with me about some specific programs if you want to uh, a bit later on. I guess this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.